Hi everyone, it's Gary Neville here. We've got some unbelievably exciting news on the overlap. After our live show in Manchester last year, we decided to take the overlap on tour. On stage with me will be Roy Keane, Jamie Carragher, Josh Denzel and Kelly Cates. Tickets are available now. Make sure you come down and watch us, but remember, only if you like. Let's get it on. <laughs>Brought to you today by Skybet. We're going to dive straight into it now. I know he's been itching to talk about it all along. We are going to discuss Manchester United. Um, didn't go great yesterday, um, defeat. But what have you made of Eric Ten Hag so far, Gary? Um, I think he's had a good start, very good start. Um, in difficult circumstances, you know, the transfer window was a shambles. You know, I know that many may feel that at the end they got it right through Casemiro coming in and, and, and Anthony. But still, those players should have been with him, you know, at least a month or two before the De Jong situation. And now to fix all the sort of Rabiot stuff, he had to come through all that. He had the transfer request from Cristiano Ronaldo on the eve of pre-season. That's obviously continued to rumble on right the way through, even to this, to this day. Um, he's had the Harry Maguire situation where obviously his captain hasn't been informed. He's had the two bad defeats at the start of the season. So I think overall, considering what he's had to come through, I think he comes through really well through the period. I don't think United fans, me, would ask for any more. But I mentioned it before on Chelsea, the, the money that's been spent, you're still looking at the team and thinking, as, you know, you're still thinking he needs to actually strengthen in all areas. I made the statement last week. That I think in United, all areas? Pardon? In all yeah, areas? Absolutely. I don't think there's any area in the team that you wouldn't think at this moment that the club need to strengthen. I mean, up front, I know that Everton have just been talking about the front three there. I think United's front players... I, I, I think that they're the least talented out of the, front, out of the top six. I think I'd swap every other club's. Chelsea's the only one I'm a little bit like that about. But I think every other player, every other squad in the top six forward players, I would swap for hours. You think that they've spent all the money on, obviously, Sancho, doesn't always play, Martial, in and out. So we're, we're, I mean, we've got to the point now where we're relying upon Martial to come back. Martial had been written off by 99.9% .9 of Manchester United fans as being a signing or a player that would no longer contribute to the club and feature for the club. We're now actually waiting for him to come back. That's the position we're in. So I think that up front is a real problem. Um, midfield, I like the midfield. I like it. We've got five players in there. We've got Fred, McTominay, Casemiro, um, Fernandez, Eriksson. I like it. Will it win you a league? No, it won't, I don't think. Um, and the back four isn't strong enough yet okay. because there still isn't a partner for Martinez. He, Martinez has done better than I think most of us thought. The full-backs, I think we still need strength in depth. I thought it was interesting when I asked Eric Ten Hag uh, about Dallo after the um, game last Saturday, I forgot, West Ham, where Dallo was absolutely sensational in that second half, heading the ball away at the back post. It was the best I've seen him defend. He was brilliant. And I said to him about, does that solve your problem at right back? And he said, no, I still want another right back. He almost said those words, but said, you know, we need two right backs. So I think even he's saying he needs another right back. Um, there's no doubt we need potentially a partner full time because Varane, Varane is looking like he's always going to get injured. It's unfortunate. You know, we talk about the Calvert Lewin, mm. but he's always got an injury. So I think there is still strength in, uh, areas to strengthen in all parts of the team. And But the, the manager's done really well, I think. OK, what, what about you, Adam? Oh, as a Man United fan, what have you made of Eric Ten Hag? <clears throat> I'm buzzing with the manager. I think, obviously, the result against Aston Villa wasn't ideal. Um, and I, like Gary, I was hoping we could beat Villa, beat Fulham, go into the World Cup on a positive run. And I think with some of the games that would have been played, we probably would have been in the top four if if we had got those results. So it was disappointing, but I think he got it wrong in the sense that playing Donny van der Beek away from home, Emery's first game, the crowd are going to be up for it. I thought that was a mistake and it reminded me of the mistake when, he, when we played City away and he didn't play Casemiro. I thought maybe, you know, next season he doesn't do that kind of thing because, you know, he's still learning the ropes in the Premier League. But overall, I'm, I'm happy with the manager. I think we're moving in the right direction. The football's continuously getting better. Um, I think he did sort the defence and now with Varane, it's a little bit of a worry. But like Gary says, in terms of the big issues, Harry Maguire, he's not playing anymore and rightly so, but it's not a story anymore. Um, the Cristiano Ronaldo thing, I thought, you know, he's kind of been forced to play him. 
Um, but I think he's handled it so well that if we did have Sancho, um, Anthony, Bruno, Martial fit and ready to start, um, I know Bruno's was suspension, if they were available and ready to start against Aston Villa, Ronaldo doesn't play. And it's, again, a non-story because I think people almost expect him not to start when everyone's fit. He so was, I think he he's handled it well. He was captain. And I thought, I mean, I think that's just, you know, he's one of the leading, more, more mature figures in the dressing room. I don't, really? I don't think he... Mature. Huh? Ronaldo's mature. Come on, man. I mean, <laughs> who believes that, really? One of the most experienced players in the dress room, and he's won the lot. I mean, he's got more history than you lot. I'm so. sure he's oh! <laughs> great footballer, but massively immature. I mean, mandate. he shouldn't be at the club anymore, and I, I think we are coming to a transfer window where, you know, do we let go of Cristiano Ronaldo? And I think we are in a better position without him. Um, and even if we don't replace him, I think we should kind of. Let, let, let me ask you, on. Gary. Um, the Cristiano Ronaldo situation, which is a very, very difficult situation for any manager to deal with. Do you think Eric Ten Hag's handled that well? And yeah. also, in January, do you think it's time to let Cristiano Ronaldo go? I, I, I think he's handled it so well. I actually thought even Oli, to an extent, and Ranić handled him quite well last season at times when it was difficult and he was obviously wasn't happy. And I think that Eric Ten Hag's handling it far better I think most of us would handle it because I think that if you had that sort of disrepute from a few weeks ago, the easy thing to do would be to say, you know, sit on the bench, certainly not give him the captaincy two or three weeks later. So I think he's handling it well. He's basically sailing the ship into shore, as I see it. And I think that in January, both of them, I, I said a couple of weeks ago, I hope that there's been a deal done that they'll say, look, in January, you will leave for both of the Cristiano and the club but we'll make sure it looks really good till then so that it doesn't look like a mess for either of us. And I'm, and I'm hoping that's what this is, that he's playing, he's captain, it looks like things have been smoothed over, which I'm sure it has. And then basically in January, he just leaves. Cristiano goes and plays somewhere where he can play every single week, which we all want to see him play every single week. I want to see him break all the records, but he isn't going to play at United every single week. The manager doesn't want him to play every single week, it's clear. Um, and that continual sort of pressure of having him on the bench it happens sometimes. It happened under Sir Alex where that, that some players, and I was seeing this to Roy in the studio, like some players have such a mentality, a fierce mentality beyond anything that you can describe in words that they have to play. And that's because they're just that great. They've been that good that there's just something inside them that means they have to play. Um, and Cristiano's got that. Um, he, he isn't going to sort of what would be play one week, not play the next, support the squad. That, that's just not what he does, not what he is, not what his career's about. So for me, I hope it ends in January for both of them so that they can basically get on with what they want to do, which is Eric Ten Hag build a fresh new squad. Cristiano wants to play every single week at a club whereby he can guarantee that almost. Are you surprised, Jamie, that he was, you know, made captain of the team? Because, you know, they could have given it to the keeper. He's, he's normally no, but the captain, I, isn't I, he, De Gea? Um, I, I, don't but... think it, I don't think it's that big a deal. Who the, who the captain is so much now in football. And I think, you know, if Ronaldo wasn't captain, I'd have probably thought that was actually strange coming out. Yeah, we could have given it to normally it's know, it, is, it is Cristiano Ronaldo, let's not forget that. But I think it's actually really clever from the manager. I think the manager also said, he said, uh, I don't think he likes goalkeepers being captain, the fact that, you know, they're in goal. But, but I think he's handled the Ronaldo thing unbelievably well in that he's shown his authority with, you know, taking out the squad a couple of weeks ago. But then also putting them back in, he can't lose. Because if Ronaldo scores and they win, fantastic for him, he's getting results. If Ronaldo doesn't perform, he looks right again for not playing him and not using him. And people then will be saying, you know, you, 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 you're a big United fan, it's not right. You're saying it's better he goes in January. He can just almost sit back. He's done his job now, Ten Hag, with Ronaldo. He's shown his authority. Ronaldo knows where he stands or you can't be messed about this guy. And he just sits back and just lets it play out. I, think it'd be, I don't think it'd be as easy as you think to get out in January. Because everyone knew he wanted to go in the summer. They both would have to take a financial hit, Yeah, well, but what I'm saying, I, I'm not sure Ronaldo... They are, they are. Yeah, of course they will. I don't think no one's going to give Ronaldo his wages. That's why he's still at the club. But I think for Ronaldo, I don't see him just going to some Mickey Mouse league anyway because he's so driven. He still wants to get goals in Europe and be the, the record goal scorer there, you know, proper leagues. I just There's something about him and that's the way he acts and that's where he comes across because he is so driven and he wants to break every record. So I don't see him maybe going to the talk of Messi going to the MLS. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm wrong. Or a league in... Dubai or Qatar or something, I don't know. But uh, 
I couldn't speak highly enough of Ten Hag, the way he's handled it. I think he's handled that. And that's, for me, <coughs> if I'm looking at Manchester United this season, they've had some good results. Some Obviously, yesterday was a bad result for them. But that is the most impressive thing that makes me think, yeah, they've got a proper manager. Do you know I really hope about Cristiano? That he obviously, if he's played his last Manchester United game... On he shakes Sunday, your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Christian. <laughs> no, if he's, if, if, you bottle that one, dude. What happened? Come on. He's got to talk. <laughs> this is hey, Come on. Have you watched your? Have you, come on. Have you watched your? I don't want. He's not my mate. Have you watched your? He's your mate. He's not my mate. He's not, not now. <laughs> no, seriously. Do you know what I hope he do? I think he should actually. I think he should actually speak. No one's heard him speak for six months. We don't hear from him. And I think as a Manchester United player, the reason I think I posed a couple of weeks ago when I was having that sort of discussion with Roy was that I felt a little bit disappointed, enough to be able to say, I think Manchester United would be better without him and I think that ultimately he would be better without Manchester United was. I expect so much of him, just because I've played with him for six, seven years, eight years, of the fact that you take ownership of, of, of what happened. You don't leave other people to go out there and answer your stuff for you. He's going out yesterday as the captain of Manchester United and the team lose. Your job is to speak at the end of the match. You know that. I know that. Your job's to speak. You're the captain. I've been there. He's been there. You lose. Unfortunately, you win. And the striker who scored the goal goes out and speaks. The star man. If you lose, it's your goalkeeper, it's your centre-back, it's your captain. Does he care? I mean, because he cares about himself, mainly. No, but that's my point. I mean, does he you, care why, why, to, yesterday, he sure why yesterday have we not heard from Cristiano after the game as captain of the club? This is, what, this is what we did wrong today. We should, we're going to work hard for next week. We're going to play Aston Villa again on Thursday in the Carabao Cup. That's the thing for me. I think if you hear oh, from oh, him, it's going to be just PR. Just, I, I don't think it's going to be protection of his image and protection of, you know, fair enough, what he's built up. So it's, it's like with Manchester United. Whenever they speak, it's all... Bullshit. But just, do you know what I mean? You, know, it, but you, you know, never get the real... When Rashford uh, came in the studio, and I didn't quite make it because I was up on commentary, came into the studio after the West Ham game and he did that interview. That's the most natural I've seen him <coughs> for 18 months. It was the most relaxed I've seen him, the most confident I've seen him, just because he came out and did it. He just came out and did it. We've seen James Madison do interviews with us. We've seen Michael Antonio at West Ham. We've seen, I'm trying to think of all the other players that we've seen come out and stand in the studio. And they go up in your estimation so much just mm, by the fact yeah. that you realise how normal they are, what good lads they are, the fact that they're just ordinary lads just trying to do the very bit, best. A bit like uh, Erling Haaland, who came out and spoke <laughs> at the weekend after their great win. How good's he been? Incredible, genuinely. I, on it, I tweeted back in July when we signed him, I've got a feeling he's going to redefine what goal scoring is in the Premier League, um, simply because of De Bruyne. And I remember chatting to you as well, the last time we were on the overlap, saying how he wasn't, he wasn't going to make the difference between 100 points and whatever. It was more that he was going to kill games off earlier, which is, uh, it's happened, you know. City looked more comfortable a lot earlier on in games because he's, he's on another level, ruthlessness. We can talk about Jesus, of course, being wonderful for Arsenal, but he sort of wasn't what City needed. We have so many honest incredibly hard working talented footballers but we needed a killer you know an absolute ruthless killer in front of goal and Haaland is he's programmed to score goals he's absolutely ridiculous and that's what we City needed if we didn't need someone's going to work hard and run and run up front Haaland's come in and like everything about his game is suited to Manchester City Football Club you know with Kevin De Bruyne and Bernardo Silva and all those people feeding to him he also has that Probably something that City lacked for a while, actually. Genuinely lacked since Aguero, maybe. And maybe even Aguero didn't have it in the Champions League as well. I can say that, honestly, as a City fan. But I think Haaland has that, that mentality, you know, that we talk about Ronaldo and people like that. He has that superstar aura where it goes we his just, way. We you know? just didn't know whether he'd settled, did we, in the first season. That was the thing. I, I never that was the question. That, honestly, never understood it. Because I think everything yeah, about there, his career there, showed there it. There are examples. For Norway, for Mould, no. for um, no, Salzburg, there are examples. for Dortmund. In City, there are examples of players not settling in that first season. Goals, about aren't it? It's just chances. Chances. He could, he could have done that. He proved it at the start of the season. Didn't need any touches. Just needed a chance to score. I actually think... Even though he's been amazing, I still think there's more to come, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. in that. I just think the way City play, because teams drop so deep, I think he could be absolutely devastating, sort of like seeing him sprinting from the halfway line onto sort of through balls. Knocking. There was a goal, I think, against Brighton, where he, the goal does come from deep. The goalkeeper goes long yeah. and he knocks someone out the way and then puts it in. I think we could actually see more of that if he was playing for a different team. But the way City play... And the thing I love about... You talk about his mentality... When you watch him play and you watch him, you look at him and you think, he's a, he's a bit mad, this fella, <laughs> in a good way. Even like, I, I remember Pep Guardiola trying to hug him when he come off a pitch or something. He was like, he wasn't even looking, you know, Pep Guardiola's like the greatest manager in the world. He's not even like, and he's, he's just like knocking even Pep out. He's not even, 
in his head, I think he just thinks, you know, no one's on my level, even the manager. I, I know what I've done. Get Did out you the see way. if he gets full of just... obviously, the, the goal last minute, he went over to Pep. Like, yeah, but what I'm saying is yeah. he's got them eyes where he just, like, I, I, I always get asked when I do Champions League, it always comes up like it did Messi, Ronaldo, Mbappé. Uh, Harland, oh, yeah. and I always say Harland, and I just say it because of his eyes. I just look at his eyes, and I don't think anything. <laughs> Do you it's remember just, when he missed got... the chances in the Community Shield, and he had that look afterwards? And uh, yeah. I mean, it's fair, you said you weren't worried about him then, but no, that look no, was he like, just, I'm he's got the eyes where I don't think he's intimidated by no. anything. Any player he comes up against, who he plays with, who he's against, he just thinks I'm going to score two. How many, how many goals? How many goals do you reckon he'll get this season? Well, what's he on? What's he on 18 now? Eighteen and twelve at the moment. Eighteen and twelve for him personally. He's going to get forty. Yeah, 40. fourteen, forty. Oh, in the, so he's got he's got twelve he's got eighteen and twelve Premier League games. Twenty five games left. He needs he needs another fourteen to match Salah's record. He's going to do that easy, easy. He'll have a game where he scores five goals and all that. I have to say that to be fair, I, the, the Manchester derby. I, I've not seen a performance like that for a long time in the Premier League. And City have been a great team. Liverpool have been a great team for the last few years. But when you talk about something, it just makes you go, "What the hell was that?" Which is very, you know, sometimes Barcelona 10, 12 years ago when you see a performance, mm. or maybe there's a moment at United where you just think, wow, you know, when Cole and York in, in Barcelona, or where maybe when Ronaldo, Tevez, and Rooney were together in 2008. But there was a, a level that you saw that day from Haaland that was and like. Foden as well, too. Foden as well. Foden as well in that game as well. Yeah, but that game was, to was me, Haaland. was just, that was a different level that. That told me that they're going to win this league. They're actually a canter. Sometimes I can imagine a team that's that good gets a little bit bored when they're playing against a sort of a team that's less than them. I just, you just start, they need motivation to be able to continually get up. But I think they'll absolutely coast the league. I really do. I, and I know, I, actually, that, I know rugby don't like that. Contradictually, that, I don't think we played as well sometimes. <laughs> that, that, I don't think we're controlling the ball as well sometimes no, as we did last season because obviously I, we substituted. You're not Coles smooth. Nine, but, you're yeah, not smooth. Agree. But I think you're a better team, and to be fair, more rounded, I agree, can actually yeah. watch you a lot more now as a team. I it, it, was, it was a bit boring, <laughs> wasn't it? It was like it was. Just, I wasn't bored. I'll be honest. No, Gary, but I'm yeah. saying it's it. a little bit like. Oh, whereas mm. actually, Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool team, you'd always want to go and watch that. Pochettino's Tottenham team. There's there's always electricity. There's always that thing that something would happen. The other, but actually, City, it was almost like so repetitive of what would happen. You just almost knew what every pass was going to be before it happened. Yeah. Whereas with now with Haaland, there's that explosion of difference. That's that something that makes you think, what is that? And there's that unpredictability to you that I think the great teams have that win knockout games. You mentioned it before. Yeah. So I, you, I think you're set up, to be fair. You've got a good draw this well, morning. It's a, shame, it's a shame he's not going to be at the World Cup Haaland, isn't it? Oh. Well, that's great for us, City. That's it? great, great, great for is it, though? No, is Norway. It? Norway aren't there, are they? So. No, no. Is it a good thing that he has five weeks? I, I personally football? think so, given the fact that he's got that, you know, that injury history. And he's the kind of person as well, Harden, as you said, he's got the eyes where you really think he's going to be happy sat in watching the world's greatest be there on that biggest stage mm. about him. He's going to be sat there seething. He you, wants to be involved the, the, in the, champ, the Champions League now, though, when you see that draw today, you see Liverpool have obviously it's got huge. Madrid. It's huge. You see, what was the other big draw? PSG by me. Yeah. I mean, it feels like it has to be. Man City this the season. The Champions League is, like, I don't know, I've not seen City win it, but obviously, Gary, you know, you know, but you do have to have those, those killers, don't you, really? Those uh, big game players. And we saw well, Real away last year, year was like, I mean, what, I mean, it was unbelievable. It was that it? game where the first game we should have, yeah. Yeah, the first leg, even, when we should have. Le Leipzig, you've we got. We so many chances. Leipzig, isn't it, that you've got. So Leipzig, yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously, yeah. looking at it now. Like, pressure's I, on, by the way, the pressure's on City, City it is, to win it, it this year, isn't it? I mean, there's no excuses this year now. The You've we've got, got Haaland, you just spoke about it, the killers. Alvarez as well, You've, man. He can really and score goals. I mean, those so you've got to win it this year, haven't they? I'd, you see, you have to win it every year, given what we've got, given the, the expectations. But don't you think in City. particular this year, Absolutely. No, on. I genuinely agree. I do. I think the, the pressure's on City, and I think this is the first year that, I wouldn't ever say I expect City to win it, but this is the first year that I've got no reason why we shouldn't, like, you know, genuinely. Um, I, I would expect you to win it. Yeah, well. I mean, obviously I'm a City fan. I'm, I've not done it, so I can't say, and, oh, I expect us to win it, because... I'm still enjoying just everything that we've been witnessing, but I do think the, the, the missing missing link was a Harland and or so like you saw. I know we just talked about Harland a lot, but the last two goals Alvarez has scored, they were Sergio Aguero goals. It was a, it was just a copy and paste of kind of Aguero, and to me that is another you know thing that we've been missing once again. So to those to me can make the difference in the games. Champions League games get so open towards yeah, the end of the legs, I, don't they? I, I said something last week, and I, and I do believe it in that. I think when we compare sort of Liverpool and City, I think. In the Champions League, because you've got that, Liverpool have got that history and probably City haven't, it always feels to me like Liverpool go bigger in yeah. Europe, whereas City almost go smaller because they've not won it before or they've that's not fair, sort of... Is that, is that like, 
do you feel like yourself and is that something that you know the fans feel you don't actually believe because you haven't won it before you always believe something's going to go wrong because in the last few years something you know you look at Madrid or you look at you know the goal against Tottenham yeah. you know Raheem Sterling do you always feel as if like it's not for us to win it it's I mean obviously the narrative as well is about Pep you know overthinking it allegedly and so on and it's de there's definitely been um, a sense of uh, th there may be a lack of belief or whatever or maybe that we've approached it too methodically or maybe that Guardiola side is built to dominate in a league you know not necessarily have the chaos or the belief to win in the Champions League but um, but I think the further you go and the, the easier it becomes you know we, we've been to the final before we were probably minutes away from another final last season we probably should have got there if we're being honest and I, I do think and you guys obviously are ex-pros and stuff you probably know but I, I can only presume once you've been there and been so close you don't do it the next time you're more determined and you're, more, you're less nervous about making those mistakes again so I do expect that if we get there this season honestly I, ex I expect City to win it if we get to the final if we get there I don't really see any reason why they wouldn't be massively up for it and we have got all the players and we've got the tools and I don't think there's any excuse at the point anymore. So. You know, it doesn't mean I wouldn't, wouldn't be happy with a season where we didn't win it, of course, because no, we could win the league. You tend to have those lessons along the way to winning it. You don't just ordinarily it took, win it. took Ferguson a long yeah, time, it, didn't it? it did. I think what you've, had against, what you've had against Liverpool, what you've had against um, Real Madrid, those types of clubs, actually they're the clubs that will cause you the problem in the Champions League because they don't have that inhibition yeah, around exactly. the competition. So if, if you played Liverpool in a semi or whatever it might be, that's where your problem could come because of the history and the fact you're going to Anfield. Yeah, that's where that's you, 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 but you will come mm. through one of those tests at some point, I think. I, don't, I just don't, I think it's a matter of time before I you do it. Well, whilst whilst we're on the European football, I just want to ask you both, right? Because uh, in the Europa League, Barcelona, Man United, um, that could have been a Champions League final years ago and <laughs> Liverpool versus Real Madrid. Um, in the Champions League. I mean, you both excited for those two ties. Yeah. I mean, those are unbelievable. Get a little day trip there. Little day unbelievable trip games, aren't they? <laughs> they, they? They are. And I think from Liverpool's point of view, I don't think it's a great draw. You know, I think Real Madrid have almost feel like they've had our number in the last few years. And I think if you go back to the final, I was convinced Liverpool would win. I think Liverpool, you go back to last season, I think Liverpool were a better team than Real Madrid. But a one-off game, they, they win the final. I actually think now with... Tukameni is a midfielder they brought in who Liverpool wanted. Casemiro's moved on, but he's a, he's a younger version. And I think Liverpool are not quite the same. So I actually think in some ways Real Madrid might be a touch better than what they were in, in the final last season. And I don't think Liverpool right now are the same team. But these games are three months away. Yeah. You've got a World Cup, you don't know who could be in, who could be out. Liverpool might have bought a midfielder by then. They could be rejuvenated, got Diaz back, Jota back. So I still think it's almost like a 50 50 game, yeah. really. Uh, and Gary, but, for you, I mean, for, as a Man United fan, I mean, <laughs> that could be the worst, as the worst possible draw, isn't it? To get, to I, get I, I, Barcelona. I disagree, no. I you disagree. disagree. Yeah, I disagree. I mean, you finish, you know, Man United finished second in the group. Now they I have know, to go but the he's thinking of the hotel being full. <laughs> 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 no, I disagree for two reasons. Because what, look, once you finish second, you're in the lap of the gods and you know you're going to potentially get a good team. But I think that Liverpool, I can understand why Liverpool, City, they want those easier runs to the final. And of course, it would be easy to say United get an easier run to the final. But I think United, there's something about United that we need big nights. You know, we need those massive games. And to be fair, we're not in the Champions League this season. So we need something... Just to galvanise that's something. I mean, look, at the end of the day, we may lose that game against Barcelona the, 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 over two legs. Who knows? But I, I do feel at this moment in time, the club needs to, the fans need to dream, that the club needs to dream. The players need that massive game. You know, the likes of Ericsson, Casemiro, you know, Ronaldo's still there. They do, they will enjoy that game. They will enjoy that enjoy, night. Enjoy it, but what if you go out? I mean, no, surely look, that would have been one of the trophies that Ten Hag would have been targeting at the start of the season. Finals. Yeah, so I just, you just, honestly, just, just get it out of the way, kind of honestly, thing. Honestly, you know? I, I don't see a negative out of this. They go out, mm. they've got a tough draw, didn't win the group, got a tough draw, lost to Barcelona, and then they've got a clear run for the end of the season to get, try and get into the Champions League. If they get through it, you can imagine how special that's going to be against Barcelona, the atmospheres in those two matches. They come out of it with great confidence. I generally think at this stage of United's journey, we're not sat here thinking mm. we have to win this, we have to do that. I think we just need, to be fair, to have great nights and get that sort of... You know, the, the, there's two or three atmospheres at United this season. The Liverpool one, the Arsenal one, the Tottenham one are some of the best atmospheres I've seen for a long time at United. And United mm. need that because obviously there's a massive ownership problem. 
where we were at the start of the season. The protests are still happening and need to still happen. So they need those big nights and those big moments. I'm not as mm. down about that draw. I can see why Liverpool would be, because they want to get further in the competition. But for United, it's not critical mm. that we win the Europa League this year. It's not like, a, yeah, of course, I'd love to win the Europa League. Eric Tenard to get a trophy, get us into the Champions League. But I also think that, to be fair, you finish second in the group, you're going to get a tough team at some point anyway. Moves on nicely to the next person that I wanted to speak about. Somebody who beat United in a Europa League final, Unai Emery. Mm. Back now... In the league, of course, he didn't have a great time of it at Arsenal. But he got off to a great start yesterday. For Aston Villa, do you, do you look at this, you guys, and think, that's a great appointment? I mean, that's he's a great got a lot of pedigree, hasn't he? And it's a great appointment. I mean, to be fair, you'll know how I spoke about him, because I was in Valencia for four months, and there were a lot of people at Valencia that worked with Unai Emery who said he was the absolute best. Um, he was brilliant. And obviously, his record, what he even did last season at Villarreal, what he's done at Sevilla... Mm. Um, he outperforms, he punches well above his weight, he gets the best out of teams probably when they're underdogs. You saw him yesterday, he loved that. He loved that, the idea of being the underdog. I think at Arsenal, timing, situations mm. maybe wasn't quite right for him, wasn't right for the club, and there's a lot of expectation at Arsenal. I think the fact that he is a big manager, I think at Villa now... He's an elite manager. Would you, would you class him as an elite? When, you, when I, you look at all the things he's won... I think he's an elite manager. It, it, it depends what you class as elite... Elite might be different. Elite's obviously different for you. It's not. You usually might be saying he's got to be the Champions League to be an elite man, and an elite manager's got to be a Champions League winner. I think he's a top manager. I think certain managers are right for certain clubs. He's been to Paris Saint Germain and Arsenal, and didn't didn't go particularly well. But done okay, but not particularly well. Whereas he's had his success with Valencia, getting them sort of in the top four mm. year after year. Uh, Seville. Uh, your Europa League, going to Villarreal. These teams are your basically Europa League teams. So that's what Villa should, I always think, aspire to be. In the top eight, almost in Europe, basically what West Ham have been doing for the last few years, that's where Aston Villa should be, biggest club in the Midlands, and you've got no one better if you're going into that competition. So I, I really do think it is a great appointment because that, I think Villa is the perfect level for them. All right, we're going to move on to uh, some of the Midlands <coughs> clubs now in the Premier League. Um, let me start off with Wolves. We've got Finn here. Um, Finn, are you worried about Wolves at the moment? I mean, when, when I saw some of the signings they made at the start of the season, I thought Wolves would have a, have a good season, but it's all gone wrong, hasn't it? Yeah, you and me both. It's been a bit of a, a back down to reality, really, the last few years. I mean, I never thought I'd see my club in Europe at Wembley, and I've seen that, and now it's right back where you belong, almost. Um, so it feels more natural in the relegation zone or the championship, but um, as you say, with the signings, I mean, we're breaking records for Nunes. I mean, Pep Guardiola said last season, one of the best midfielders in the world. Um, so to get that praise, Wolves fans were buzzing. Uh, Guedes as well. I don't know whether you've had him at Valencia, Gary, but... No, I don't, but I know about just him, after. Yeah. Um, He's at Paris Saint-Germain as well, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. So he's done the, the Mendes tour, um, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, on paper, even when we sacked Bruno, Wolves said this is, that we feel that this is the best squad we've had um, ever. But a big thing's been... Um, the transition from the five to the four, I know probably commentating on Wolves games in the past hasn't been that, that interesting. We'd win one nil if we did. We'd always disrupt the big six, have boring games against the bottom teams. Um, so we've gone to this four and we still can't score goals and we're conceding a lot more. So um, the loss of Connor Cody, um, Jamie's boy, has been, has been big as well. Um, so I don't know really where we go from here, but bringing in a, a European what? winning manager is, is looking good you now. Know, you know towards the end, tried to change it from a five mm. to a four, didn't he, as well, to become more expressive but no manager seems to be able to have broken that sort of what would be that sort of that system block that seems to be there. Well, even when, when Bruno came in straight after Nuno, we tried it in pre season. I think he quickly realised, right, we can't do this. Went back to the five. And last season, we weren't great either. I think it was a, a lower mid table finish. But no blame was ever at the manager because it was sort of right. He's working with Nuno's players. This is built for a five. Um, we're not going to score goals. It's going to be. Uh, like 1 0 wins, but we were happy with that. Now it's 3 0 losses. Um, so well, you, got, you had a couple at the weekend, don't remember that. You scored a couple. We did get two, yeah, I'm sure we, we, we must be lowest scorers in the league still. So two was, yeah, it was big to add on. If anyone's lower, then I feel really we'll sorry for I them, think we'll really it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, horrible. But I'm, I'm used to not scoring goals, it's just the, the leaky defence. So you've got rid of the famous back three, it was Cody, Bolly, Sace, and now they've all gone in one summer. If you are going to transition, maybe a little bit slower than that, because as I was seeing now, yeah, it's not really a team. Jamie, um, what have you making of Wolves? I mean, the manager situation as well. I mean, they're in a right, it, it, they're in a right just, mess at the moment. It just aren't they? feels a little bit 
flat. You know, it has, you've had that sort of, as you said, finishing sen, uh, seven twice, I think, under uh, noon, or it just seemed to, like, just become boring, didn't it? Mm. Really. Uh, and when you were getting Wolves games for Sky, you're a bit like, oof. Yeah, sorry. You know, it just, no, it just <laughs> felt like that. You know, just the, the same sort of thing. But it felt like that from your own supporters. It never felt like there was a... A buzz or an excitement after you've had those the initial first. The DJ was alright. I used to love the DJ from whenever I was ever yeah. there before. Yeah, yeah, that was Friday yeah. night. Friday, Friday night, night. Yeah, yeah, it was all good. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about this? The new manager is it Lop Lopetegui? Lopetegui. Probably a bit too good for Wolves. Yeah, very happy with it. Um, Spain, Real Madrid, winning the Europa League with Sevilla, and then you've got to move to Wolverhampton as well after being in those places. So, it's a, it's a, again, it's a tremendous cycle, but. No, yeah, very happy with that. I think even the temporary, the caretaker manager at the moment said we need an identity. He's going to bring that. His identity is four at the back, so whether that's going to work, it, I don't know. But. It goes to that point before, though, doesn't it, about style. Even if you're mm. being successful, which seventh for Wolves is obviously, yeah. you know, it's success, it's relative success. The fans will eventually not be happy if what they're watching is they don't. They won't accept it anymore. They might mm. put up with it for one season, one trophy, but they will have to sort of like a second season, third, mm. they'll start to say... I want more than this. And even, even us, I've spent most of my life in the Championship. You, you finish in Europe, but fans do get picky, like we were saying with Tottenham uh, and Conte. If you are playing like that, they want something more. And maybe, I mean, you've seen with Stoke, teams like that, you want something more. And maybe you were better doing what you were doing. Um, yeah. But hopefully, yeah, with the new manager, we'll, uh, we'll learn. Okay, let, let me, Chris, um, a Nottingham Forest fan, another one of the, uh, the Midlands clubs, um, of course, promoted to the uh, Premier League this season. Spent a lot of money, bought in a lot of players. Um, what have you made of it so far? I mean, it's a bit of an impossible job for your manager, isn't it? Yeah, I think he's probably had the hardest job in the league. Um, what he's in against us. <laughs> 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 he, yeah, but in 21 players, he probably still doesn't know his best team. Um, but luckily, he's still got the fans behind him. Like Jamie was saying earlier, maybe um, a lot of the teams down there aren't happy or just change the manager. I think. The fans at Forest are willing to give Steve Cooper the whole season, really. Um, you know, we were 20, 20 odd years out of the Premier League. He was the one to bring us back. He's going to get this season, I think, if the owners, you know, the owners are a little bit trigger happy. But I think we'll give him the season. He needs to find his best team. Uh, he needs to do it quickly. But uh, do, you, do you think um, Forest are good enough to survive? <sighs> We're gradually getting better. I think first half against Brentford was really good until uh, Lee Mason got involved with VAR. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what he was doing there, but performances are gradually getting there. I think the World Cup will help. We've not got too many going away, um, so we get to learn more about his players. Maybe bring a, three or four more in. I know that sounds, <laughs> that sounds, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds a bit ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just got to give Steve Cooper time, and I think. We may just sneak there. We've got to hang around. Okay. You, you know, if we, I know Steve Cooper well from his, his time at Liverpool, and it's going to be tough for you to stay up. Yeah. You, you know, you know that. When you say you'll get the end of the season, the fact he brought you up from the Championship, do you, do you think they'd change the manager if you went down, or you say he's the best play, person maybe to take us back? Well, yeah, for me, it would. If you if you're looking like you you're not good enough, you you keep him because he's the man you want in the Championship. It's like we saw with Fark, but. Norwich back up again, didn't he? Oh. So, so yeah, I think you keep him. Whether you, we go and spend a bit more money after the World Cup and the performances are not improving, and we still maybe have a chance, do the owners go, okay, that's the time we we change and try and stay in this league? Mm. That'll be the time. But whether you know, I'd personally give him the whole season. I think he's a good manager. Uh, I think we don't know what his ceiling is. If you bought someone like a Benitez in. That was rumoured early on uh, in the season. That you probably know where that ceiling is. I think Steve, he's still a pretty, pretty young manager. He's not not had too many years in senior football, really. Uh, obviously, won the World Cup with the uh, England youth team. So, okay. Yeah, I would definitely give him the end of the season. Okay. Whether we're going to be good enough, I don't know. It's it's a, it's a brutal league. Leicester, of um, obviously they've kept hold of their manager. And they're really picking it up over the last few weeks. Um, great win for them at the weekend. Some great goals in that game, by the way. And James Madison, he's on fire at the moment. I mean, does he make the England squad for you two? Gary, you first. I think it's going to be the big thing this week, um, whether he does make the squad. We interviewed him, didn't we, obviously, after the Monday Night Football a few weeks ago. There's something there, isn't there, that's not connecting? Because maybe... the 
Gareth feels like he's got Mount, he's got Grealish, he's got Foden, he's got players of that ilk. He's that... been playing better than no, no, probably saying... Foden out of it. He's been better than him, though. Yeah, but I think those three, Mount's a constant for Gareth Southgate. He's definitely going to be in. Grealish is going to be in, and Foden's obviously going to be in. So he's already got three. So it's a case of then, does he feel like he needs a fourth of them? We would all probably say, yeah, get James Madison in. But I, my doubt is just Gareth, just of the way in which he's approached picking his squads for three or four years, his consistency in terms of who he selects, how he selects them, what you have to do to sometimes get in. And if your name's not down, you sometimes don't get in. Isn't it good um, sometimes where, you know, when you go into a World Cup where somebody that no one's expecting, that person that just brings a bit of excitement to the camp. Couldn't the this be Madison? Do you, do you know what the problem is for a manager, and I've been there, I've been to eight tournaments, is that when there's a focal point of a... Uh, do we think James Madison should start for England? Some may say, yeah. Why but not? Le, not many would probably put him in the starting eleven in the, in the first game. Some would, but probably not many would. You'd pick Grealish, Foden, Kane, Sterling, um, Bellingham... Rice, you'd pick those players, Mount, you would pick those players probably because your guy's going to pick them. So then what will happen is with England, all the noise comes become, becomes about somebody who's not playing. And I've seen that in tournaments before. It's the guy on the bench, get him on, you've got to get him on. So all the media, all the noise that a manager then has to face is around this one player. So Gareth's got to decide whether he thinks that's going to be a positive noise for him or whether that's going to eventually become a negative noise. Sometimes England managers in the past have decided... I'd rather get that negative noise out before the tournament, deal with it, and then no one's talking about it, than actually having that person on the bench and then think, right, everyone's thinking he should be first sub. It was a bit like that with Jack in the last tournament. If you remember when mm. everyone said, get Grealish in, get Grealish on. And when Jack came on, he didn't do that much, really, if you remember in the tournament, in the, in the Euros. But th there's a bit of that about Madison at the moment, as there was about Jack Grealish in the last tournament. And I'm looking at it from a point of view. I hope, I hope he goes. I love him when I watch him play. I love him when he comes and does interviews with us. So there's, I've got nothing bad to say about him. My only thing will be, having been there with England, that how a manager will look at it, how a coach will look at it, he'll be considering those things, I think. What, take, what about you? Yeah, you yeah take I'll him? take him. Yeah, I actually did a squad last night. I just probably a bit bored, just doing my own little squad. <laughs> and I just think the fact that the oh, squads have gone us. from... Share it with us. Oh, come on. Yeah, because uh, for me, he's in the squad. Because I want to see him. I want to see some excitement. And he'll bring that, wouldn't he? You think exactly. he brings that excitement? Yeah, then Pickford, Ramsdale, Pope, Trent, uh, so Trent, Ben White, Kyle Walker, John Stones, Eric Dyer, Harry Maguire, Conor Corey, Kieran Trippier, Luke Shaw, Declan Rice, Bellingham, Henderson, Mason Mount, James Madison, Calvin Phillips, James Ward Prowse. Kane, uh, Harry Kane, Marcus Rashford, Ivan Tony, Raheem Sterling, uh, Foden, Saka, and Grealish. That twenty six. That sound good to you? Yeah. No, no, Callum Wilson. No, it's too injury prone. He went off again at Southampton. I just don't think you can take the risk. Do you think that's the squad? So I know you've said you'll take, and I'm answering it from both sides. I would take James Madison. Do you think Gareth will take? Do you think Gareth will take James Madison? I think he will. I think he will. I just think that his actual performances this season, I know he's not been in the squad, but, I'm, yeah, I, I think he'll just take him. I think he'll just sneak in the fact... If it was 23, I don't think he would, but the fact it goes to 26, I just think, why would you not pick... He's in quality. Right now, he's playing as well as anybody in the country in those positions, maybe besides Foden. But, yeah, I watched him on Saturday, and I know you don't choose someone over one game, I'm just picking him on that. His performance has been going back probably 18 months. Uh, but... Yeah, he's too much quality. And I think he's got... I, what you're saying about someone coming into the squad who's sort of new, I think it'd be difficult for someone who's never played for sort of two years, I think he hasn't played for England, to go in and play for England. But he's one of the few I think could. Because I think he's got the arrogance. And I, and I use arrogance as a positive. He's got the football arrogance. He'll go there. And I think he believes he's as good as the players you've just named. He'll want the ball. He wouldn't go hiding in his shell. And I'm not just saying in terms of games, because he mightn't, he mightn't play. But in training sessions, I think he'd make his presence felt as well. And I, I, I think I'd 100% pick him. And I think Gareth will just find a place for him. Any, any, any shocks in the list for you? No, I, I, to be honest, yeah, I said James yesterday, because, honestly, if this was a 23-man squad, I think Madison and Alexander-Arnold could struggle to get in. And I think mm. they would be massive omissions because Gareth would then come under pressure uh, because of the talent of those two players. I think the fact there's 26 players, I think almost Gareth can take a squad where it keeps everybody happy. The pressure will still yeah. come, 
But that's not what it's supposed to be about, is it? No, 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 what I mean is, no, but one, no, mm. let's be, no, let's be clear, when you're picking a squad of 23, the worst thing for an England manager is making that phone call to that one or two players who've served you well or are playing well or you think, I don't like making this call. That always happens. There's always been one or two players that people think should go that, haven't, that basically don't go. Mm. With 26 players on the list, I have to say Gareth is in a position to be able to make sure that he can keep himself happy with the players that he wants there, but also he can bring players, which means that he doesn't get the massive criticism pre-tournament through leaving one or two. So I think the 26, I think the 26 is a bit of get out of jail free, uh, free card for Gareth and to be fair for other international managers. It's just a, it's a massive amount of players. I mean, honestly, with England, people argue over the England squad. You're only ever arguing over one or two players. Everyone else agrees on the 21 or 22. Mm. You're only talking about one or two players, like Callum Wilson or James Madison, Callum Wilson or even Tony. You're not talking about sort of like Harry Kane here being left out or anybody that's like... You're talking about literally the sort of what would be player number 18, 19, 20 uh, in your squad. So for me, I think that he probably would pick that squad. I think the problem will still come if we lose a game in the group or if some get to a, 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 a second round game and then all of a sudden... Alexander Arnold's not playing and England don't score, or Madison's not playing and we don't create a chance. The problem will still come with those two players down the line, I think. Okay, let's move to Leeds. We've got uh, Connor here. Um, of course, you know, a few of your players will be playing against England in the World Cup for America, isn't it? Yeah. So um, that's going to be interesting. But uh, you've got a US manager as well in Jesse Marsh, and he's turning the corner now, isn't he? I mean, or no, yeah, your expression says no. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit more cynical, but um, it's the style of football for me that I'm not 100% convinced on. I think in the Premier League, you have to have possession and it's all about turnovers, kicking the ball up as quickly as possible and then recovering that ball in the attacking third. And Leeds have really struggled with that this season because teams, Bournemouth have done it, Fulham have done it. They just clip the ball over the press and then because Leeds press in about five, six units, were exposed, were vulnerable. And it's funny against the top teams, so Liverpool, um, incredible performance, but it's because Liverpool are trying to pass through us. And, the, you know, the pressing units work, then it's effective. But if you just get simple tweaks, playing the ball over, route one, big Sam-esque, Leeds really struggle with that. And I think Leeds fans are understanding, I know we've turned a corner a little bit, but the long-term view is it seems very vibey. Seems very vibes, you know, at the weekend it was it seemed to be Allen Road pushing the side on. We came back against Bournemouth, but Bournemouth should have been respectively five or six one up at the time. Fulham should have been five or six one up at the time going into the, the break at half time. So I'm a little bit more cynical about it. But he has turned the corner a little bit. Two wins in two. But for me, um, the jury's still out. But is there a thing with Jesse Marsh? And you, you, we, we, we met, was it your first game for the club or second game? It was a Wolves, I think, wasn't it? Wolves, yeah. Away, you two it and it's it? almost yeah. one of them. I thought Leeds could go down last season. Yeah. I thought, is it one of those things that because of, not necessarily who he's following, but just because of the fact that there is a little bit of the fact that just because he's American, mm. there's always, always, the jury's out from day one. Almost like there's never, is he ever going to be accepted? And that's not just by actually Leeds fans. Do you know what I mean by that, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a bit of that mocking. The old of Ted Lasso yeah, thing, there's isn't a bit it? of that mocking well, you know, sort the, of. Was it Bob Bradley? Was that Swansea, was it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a bit of that mocking vibe, isn't mm. there, around sort of Jesse Marsh? I does, think that, that... does that come from. I mean, that, 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 you're talking about football in general. Yeah, that's right? got yeah. enough for us. Not for us, but. but is that I feel it lead supporters as well? The it's a stigma, American. Jeremy. There's definitely a stigma there, yeah. But I think, I think we've been quite accepting as a fan base, but it's definitely there. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely there. And I, I don't know what that is because, you know... No, I can feel it. Yeah, you can ju just judge a manager on his performances, don't you? And he's, he's turned two in two. And I wouldn't say Leeds fans are looking at him and thinking, you know, it's because he's American that we want him out or anything like that. But there is, yeah, there's 100% something there about that. But the, the American lads who've come in, Tyler Adams and Brendan Aronson, who've played in his systems before, have adapted really well. Um, but the rest of the team's really struggling. We don't play with width. And I don't know if you can do that in the Premier League. Yeah, that's a different issue. I noticed with Bielsa. Bielsa had real wingers, exactly. then he, he's very narrow. Everything's mm. through the and the, sort of and middle. And the thing with Calvin Phillips as well. So Calvin Phillips came into the system and he struggled because Calvin gets the ball, drops between the centre backs, and it's pinging it left, pinging it right. But suddenly, everything's central, everything's narrow. It's all about turnovers in their phase. And it's, 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 I don't know if you can do it in the Premier League. You've seen Ralph Arsenhutl sacked. He plays oh. a very similar sort of style. I don't know if it's going to be a long-term sustainable I think, thing for I think Leeds. to lose Calvin Phillips and Rafinha, though, in, in the summer for a club like Leeds, mm. who was struggling anyway last season at times, I think just massive. Yeah. Mm. Huge play, yeah, huge players. You can't lose those two players. Yeah. Just yeah. Like, I mean, mm. You think those, they're going to be all right this season, though, Leeds? 
Mm. Yeah. I think the back four is really poor individually. I don't know what whether to do with the system, but when you sort of see them as players, you always see, feel there's mistakes there. I wasn't sure last season, so I'm not sure. I'm not, I can't be sure, no. But do you, do you just, mm. it, it's watching us, I think. There's just a real vulnerability every time we play, I think, and I think that's the problem. It's, then, it's, it's who are we suited for. under Bielsa, to be honest with you, yeah. I mean, I know exactly. we all, I know we all yeah. love him. It was a shambles, wasn't it? I yeah. mean, it was, it was absolutely all over It was over beautiful the place. to watch, in a sense, because it was just beautiful chaos. Yeah. But at, at the same, so when it worked, it worked. But when it was, I mean, like you said, six Liverpool. When it was seven, going wrong, six, it was just, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. OK, but, but yeah. let me move on to Gary. We've got Gary here, he's a Bournemouth fan. Sorry, Tom. My <laughs> it was all going so well. It was well. all going so well. Josh man. Denzel wasn't getting invited back. Did you say it was called, did, did you say it was called Gary then? I did say yeah. Gary, yeah. none of them left. <laughs> well, no, there is their manager, Gary O'Neill. So he's Good okay. point. <laughs> So, um, Gary O'Neill, he's, he's what, what, well, you, t you tell us what, the job that he's done. I mean, coming under really difficult yeah. circumstances, has been doing really well. The past couple of weeks, the, the wheels have fell off a bit and you were ahead in those games. Yeah, that was a disappointing thing. Obviously, alluded to the Leeds game there where we're 3-1 up. We were 2 nil up the week before. So, yeah, that's a... From a mentality point of view, that's a worry, not just with O'Neill and the staff, but the players themselves. Um, and if we you know, were to go ahead in the next game and then they pull a goal back, is that going to be in the head? But I think Gary, to be fair to him, he's come in after a 9-0 defeat at Anfield and then he went on a, like a six-game unbeaten run. And the way he steadied the ship has been impressive. He's, he's not been a manager and he's come in, he's picked them lads off the floor. Everyone here, I think, probably predicted Bournemouth to come 20th this season. As I'm sitting here now, we're above that dotted line. So, you know, we, we can't be too despondent. And, um, yeah, apart from the fact that Wolves are getting a new manager and it sounds like you might even buy more players in January, um, which will probably cause us some problems and we're definitely going to be in it till the end. I think what O'Neill's done is steady the ship really nicely after what was a bit of a debacle with Scott Parker. And I wanted to say to, to you, Gary, actually, because you had said about Scott Parker as a coach, was very highly thought of, wasn't he? And mm. That's two jobs now at Fulham, and Fulham fans were telling us during the good times under Scott that you wait, because he'll fall out with your owners, it'll all be a mess. And it's happened at two clubs now. And what, do you, what did you make of that? Because it um, wasn't, from a Bournemouth point of view, it was not results that he got the sack. It was not results. He was coming out after every game saying, I need help, the players aren't competitive. Yeah, and that just doesn't sit right. I actually saw it, I watched his, uh, he was on the television today, wasn't he? I was watching the pre-match mm. of the... Um, Arsenal game. Chelsea Arsenal mm. game, and he was on there. First time I've seen him for a long mm. time. It looks like he's making that move back into sort of television, which is usually the precursor yeah. to sort of searching for a job again and getting back in. But I was interested in terms of the first few questions were about that, and he talked, you know, he talked about the promotions, but then didn't talk about the difficulties had at, had at the clubs. Definitely highly thought of when uh, he was doing his coaching badges <laughs> at, um, with the, the pro license, the A license. You know, you obviously you see some sort of what, but all the coaches go through their A license and pro license. All the Premier League coaches have done it and they'll go through in a batch of with certain players and he was one of the most highly thought of that had gone through it for a long time. Um, I don't know did, where he goes he, from he, here. He, did, he, he did start be. to make noises. I suspect, what, I suspect with Scott, look, he's probably one of them that wants to design his own exit. You know, make sure he exits on the terms where it looks like he wasn't supported. Yeah. Some managers have that in them to be able to shape it in such a way. You were the master of it, Rafa Benitez, who, to be fair, always always felt like he was shaping his exit as though it was nothing to do with him. He was doing it at Newcastle where he was turning the fans on them. I mean, the fans were against the owner anyway, but he was turning the fans even more on the owner sort of by the day. And I think Scott maybe just does a little bit of, he's, he's smart, he's clever. He's probably recognising that he's going to be fighting relegation with Fulham and Bournemouth and actually, what can he do about it? You know, no manager could handle this type of situation. We hear that rhetoric sometimes from managers in interviews and he had a little bit of that. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see where he comes in next. Yeah. You know what level he comes at. I suspect for the time being, he's always going to be because of his promotions, fancied by those clubs that are trying to get out of the championship, and you know ultimately never going to be top half of the Premier League. That that's the jump he's got to try well, and make. What about the manager you've got now, Gary O'Neill? Does he? Does he? I know you've got new ownership. Yeah. Do you, does he keep the job? I'd be shocked. I don't think the plan was ever to give him the job personally. Um, and the dip in form isn't going to help him. But I, I think it was always him coming. As I use the phrase, steady the ship. 
you know, kind of get, get them players off the ground and keep it close until we get to the World Cup and the break and then we'll look again. I'll be very surprised if he got the job. As I say, if we were to achieve our goals and stay up, we'll be thanking Gary Neil for the job he's done since he's come in. But I can't see it. My only fear is I don't see a lot available to Bournemouth. We, we can't, you know, obviously Villa have just brought in Emery, for example, and there's Rafa Benitez. We're Bournemouth. We, we know, you know, I'm in a good spirit, so we've just thrown away two, two goal leads. That's Bournemouth, right? <laughs> we're, we're all right. We're happy to be competing um, at this level. But I don't see managers, even Sean Dyche, I don't see him coming to Bournemouth. And Sean Dyche is out of a job, but I don't see, why would he come to come to us really when he could probably wait for probably a bigger club so my fear is I don't really see where we're going to go there's been links with Nutson who's at Bodo Glint um, who was in Arsenal's group um, mm. in the Europa League and he's had that similar journey as kind of Eddie Howe did with Bournemouth a lower team he's built them up long term and the Norwegian League finishes very soon it would make sense that we've kind of not done anything there's not, not been any links but yeah, my only concern is who we go for because okay. there doesn't there doesn't feel like a, a lot out there at the moment. Okay, oh, we've got Russ as well, a West Ham fan. Um, and finally, and finally, and fi <laughs> oh, no, it's not like that. <laughs> it's not like that, Russ. It's That's w, how I feel at the moment. W, w in it. W's at the end, isn't it? You know what I mean? Alphabetical. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Always bottom. I've got, I've got a question for you though. Are you still behind your manager? I am. I am because I. What, what about the majority of the fans? I, I mean, I think it's. I, I think it's split. I think after yesterday, it is turning a little bit more towards. And I think it's what people were saying about the difference between performance and progression. Because yeah, we've had. You know, since he came in, you got to think what happened beforehand under Pellegrini. We were in a right state. He's already saved us once before after Slav came. It, all, all the wheels fell off. He came in, steadied the ship. I think they should have given him the job then rather than bring Pellegrini in, the experiment, spent money on Haller, spent money on Anderson, didn't work. You know, bought in a Premier League, he's won the Premier League with Man City and stuff in Pellegrini, didn't work. Bought in Moyes, he's come in, you know, we were bottom of all the running stats and stuff. He went, right, go out and get Thomas Suchek, you know, I want someone who's going to run. And we built a team around a togetherness, you know, and I've been working at the club and, and supporting the club for years and years and years. And, you know, that, that period, during that COVID period, that was the best I've seen West Ham as a team since probably the, the early 90s. You know, that togetherness. And he brought that back. And I think now, I think his downside is actually going out and spending £170 million worth of really good, really good players, technically gifted players. So I don't think that transition works with him. He well, he made a Skamaka in that. Skamaka's well, been one of those times. Uh, well, that's the thing. Skamaka, you know, you've gone out and, you know, we've been crying out for a forward since Haller. You know, that didn't work because you, you're playing a, play, a player you don't play in the right position. He goes to Ajax and absolutely smashes all the records. He was doing well in Dortmund until the illness. And for me, someone like Skamaka, he's, you know, we've gone out and bought the Italian number nine. We went out and bought uh, Paquetta, who plays, starts the Brazilian national side. We went out and bought the German right back. We've bought some really good players, but it's just not clicking. That's and the I thing, think, isn't it? Yeah, I, I watched They've I watched bought it. good players now, haven't they? There's United, all the expectations are reasonable. Yeah, yeah, the United game last was it Sunday. Sunday yeah, yeah, last Sunday. I, it's so frustrating sometimes yeah. watching West Ham that yeah. obviously I was watching the game thinking, Yo, go on. Yeah. It's like that. You just want them. They, they have, it's, it's an Everton quality. It's a West Ham quality that you just think there's more if they just go from the beginning and believe. And it takes a long time for them to think that they believe. And, and the risk comes too late. A little bit like Tottenham yesterday. The Tottenham's risk came too late in the game. Whereas West Ham's at Old Trafford. Once he took off the boy, I forgot the name. The boy's name that played behind the front, the midfield player, blonde yeah. lad, clown. Yeah. Uh, Last, yes. Downs, 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 yeah, Downs, yeah. Downs. Downs. <laughs> uh, he took the da boy Downs up and bought four and <coughs> I think, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. late on. And that, when that change was made, the game changed. And I felt as though there was still that sort of what would be that feeling of not conceding a second more than going That's, that's always been, you know, yeah, safety that, first that was, type thing. That was evident, I think, in that game against United last week, which I thought United were there for the taking. He took yeah. off, um... um so we got like a smacker. He took off Smacker at half time, but he also took off. Um, I've got his name now. <laughs> <laughs> he's, Berami. He's the, Berami. Ben Rama. He took off Ben Rama. He took ben off Ben Rama, yeah. he took ben ben Rama yeah. yesterday. <laughs> and, when, and, when, and when he Should took do this off. this section again. <laughs> <laughs> but when he took off Ben Rama, the fans, you know, you could hear them audibly. It, they it were was. very unhappy well, about yeah. that. And is one of the criticisms with Moyes at the moment is that, all right, all 
great last season. You're like that underdog manager. We know you haven't quite got the players, but now you have got some of those players. You've got a Paqueta. You've got, you know, Ben Rama. You've got... And he doesn't really know how to now play with these type of players because I think... the Is it... You know, I'm not, not speaking for a West Ham fan, but they want to see more from the team. They want to see more attacking play. Yeah, but you've got a manager in David Moyes who, who I think when he went into West Ham, it was a similar sort of club to Everton. Yeah. And he was at Everton for 10, 11 years and consistently punching above the weight and, and you know, getting to Europe. That's what he's done at West Ham. But every one of those Everton seasons wasn't fifth, sixth or seventh. They'd have the odds to finish 12th one season. Yeah. And, and at that time, with, with Bill Kenwright in charge and even the supporters always behind him, there was no panic or sort of histrionics. And I think, you know, West Ham, maybe there was a few boos yesterday, but I don't think there should ever be that panic when you've got David Moyes as the manager. You still believe they'll be fine. They might have finished sixth, like they did sixth or seventh, they finished last season. It might be a season where they finished 12th yeah. or 10th. West Ham have had a million of those seasons. Could be fighting a relegation battle as they well. Won't, they won't. I can actually guarantee you they won't fight a relegation battle with the players that they've got and the manager that they've got. They won't. No, they what won't. they need to do is have David Moyes, they'll stabilise the club. For years, West Ham have fought relegation. David Moyes will be a manager who will always keep them up. I know you want more than that, of course. But it might be a season where they finish 10th or 12th. Don't panic. Don't get carried away. The following season, he probably finish 8th. And, and I think he's just replicating everything that he did at Everton. And I think if there's any pressure or talk of David Moyes leaving West Ham, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, he's doing okay. a good job. All right, love that, missus. Don't panic. Is the message out to the West Ham we'll try, fans? We'll try not. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank all the fans that have come here today. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant. Also, thanks to uh, Jamie and to Gary and to everybody who's watched the overlap. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, can I come back maybe one day? Uh, of course. Yeah, I'd prefer you. I know there. I'm not as good looking I'd as Josh. I prefer you with your Arsenal shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> what, intimidated by that? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, listen, thank you very much, and we'll be back next time. Hi everyone, it's Gary Neville here. We've got some unbelievably exciting news on the overlap. After our live show in Manchester last year, we decided to take the overlap on tour. <laughs> on stage with me will be Roy Keane, Jamie Carragher, Josh Denzel and Kelly Cates. Tickets are available now. Make sure you come down and watch us, but remember, only if you like. Let's get it on. <laughs>